Okay, welcome back. I uh, believe last time we were talking about uh, solutions, and so we were going to talk about concentration today. So let's see if we can do that, and maybe if we're lucky, we can actually finish the whole chapter. We'll see. No promises. Okay, well, when we were talking about solutions, we said you had a solute, you had a solvent. Solute, of course, being the, the minor part, and the solvent the major part. And when you want to know how much of something is in solution, you can't just put it on the scale like a solid or a liquid. Uh, what you have to do is you have to know the volume of the solution, but you also have to know the concentration of the solution. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about dealing with concentration, different types of units, and we'll talk about uh, how to um, deal with problems involving concentration as well. So lots of different concentration units out there. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of them, but really there's one main one that that's kind of rises above the rest when you're talking about uh, concentration in chemistry, and that's something called molarity. So let's talk about molarity. All right, molarity is uh, given by the symbol capital M. That's why we use a little MOL for mole, because capital M is for molarity. And it's equal to the number of moles of solute you have over the number of liters of solution. So when you see something like, say, for example, 12 molar, that means there are 12 moles for every one liter, 12 moles of whatever it is, HCl, for every one liter of solution. All right, and that's what that big capital M means. All right, molarity kind of gives you a relationship between moles of solute and, so, and the volume of the entire solution. Now, as we go through this, what you're going to find is you're going to find there's two different types of problems that you run into with concentration. And this not only applies to molarity, uh, but it also applies to uh, any other concentration problem that you, you happen to run into. One type of problem is where they give you, you know, here's how much of this I've got, here's how much of this i got, what's the concentration of the solution? All right, when you run into a problem like that, uh, my advice is to treat it like a plug-in problem. Just, you know, well, let's see, what's the definition of molarity? Well, it's moles of solute over liters of solution. Do I num know the number of moles? Okay, do I know the number of liters? Plug it in, solve, kind of like a formula. And that's usually how you deal with those. If it's the other type of problem where they give you the concentration, they give you something, and they're asking you to find something else, I would treat it like a factor label problem, all right? And always use your, your concentration unit as a factor. Always start with the other piece of information first. Use your concentration as a factor to get what you need, all right? So just kind of remember that general principle in pretty much everything we do in this particular video, uh, and usually that will get you uh, where you need to go, all right? So let's, uh, let's talk about molarity here, I guess, for a little while. So what volume of 12 molar HCl must be taken to obtain 0.1 moles of HCl? Uh, do you see there's no way you could use a scale to do this? You can't just weigh the solution and figure out how many, um, how many moles of HCl are in there. Well, yeah, molarity might be useful here. So what pieces of information do I know about this solution? Well, I know the concentration. I know it's 12 molar. Okay, and I also know I have 0.1 moles of HCl. So what we got two things to write down here, either this or this. We're going to start with this. Never start with your concentration. Don't start with your molarity. Start with the other piece of information. So we're going to write this down, 0.1 moles of HCl. Second thing we ask ourselves is where do we want to go? What am I trying to get to here? Well, I'm trying to get to volume. Liters, milliliters, some sort of volume unit. Third thing we ask ourselves is do I know a relationship between volume of a solution and the number of moles. Well, that's where my molarity comes into play. See, If I have 12 molar HCl, that means for every one liter of solution, there are 12 moles of HCl. If I have a solution and I have 12 moles of HCl, I must have one liter of solution. And this is, uh, by the way, concentrated hydrochloric acid. 12 molar is pretty concentrated there. So what I can do is I can make that into a factor. The so factors can either be equivalent quantities, you know, one foot is equal to 12 inches, but they can also be relations. Every time I have one of these, I have three of these, right? 
So here, for every time I have one liter of solution, I have 12 moles of HCl. Or, I have 12 moles of HCl every time I have one liter of solution. So what goes on top, what goes on bottom? Well, you want the moles of HCl on the bottom. Why? Because you want your moles to cancel out. You want to be left with liters, which is what you're looking for. So you put what you don't want on the bottom, what you want on the top. You want to cancel out those units. So now we do a little math. So 0 0.10 uh, divided by 12 uh, here. Two significant figures here for exactly one liter. There's about 12 moles, so two significant figures here. So therefore, my answer should have two significant figures. So I run that through the calculator, and I get 0 0.0083. Zeros preceding non-zero digits are not significant. So two significant figures here. Right, and there's your answer. Now, typically in the laboratory, we use milliliters instead of liters, okay, because uh, liters, 5% more than the core, is a fairly large amount of liquid, you know, considering what we use in the laboratory there. So sometimes it's handy to be able to convert that to milliliters. So how would I do that? Well, I move my decimal place one, two, three places to the right, and I get 8.3 milliliters of HCl. If I had asked the question in this form and you gave me liters, I really can't count that wrong because that's that's the volume. But let's say I had a multiple choice test and I gave you that and A, 8.3 milliliters, B, 10 milliliters, C, 50 milliliters. You need to know that 0 0.083 liters is equivalent to 8.3 milliliters. So just one, two, move your decimal three places this way, 8.3 milliliters. Multiply by a thousand. All right. And that's, yeah, it's that simple. What I'm about to show you here is uh, an actual useful skill. You know, everything I've shown you so far doesn't seem to have much use, does it? But uh, this actually does. You know, when you go into the laboratory, you got all these little bottles sitting on the cart, and they have labels on them, concentration, this and that, and so on and so forth. You know, how do those get there? You know, do they just appear overnight? Does a, a, a magic solution fairy uh, come to our lab and prepare all the solutions and, and leave? Well, no, somebody's got to mix those up, right? So that's either our lab person, or sometimes we uh, hire some student workers to help us out a little bit, and they help mix things up for us sometimes. How does all that work? Because this is a skill that you could make upwards of, oh, say, $8 an hour doing. Wow. Okay. So this is kind of useful. So after I show you these next two things, you could actually do 80% of the work that is required in that journal chemistry laboratory to get it ready. Hypothetical, let's say you're working for me. That's uh, kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Uh, and uh, I need 125 milliliters of six molar sodium hydroxide solution. So I say, so I tell you, go back to the stock room, find me 125 milliliters of six molar sodium hydroxide. So you go back to the stock room, you look around, you don't see a bottle of, of six molar sodium hydroxide anywhere. All you see is this white plastic bottle which, with a bunch of white pellets in it, and it says sodium hydroxide. And the reason why is because sodium hydroxide is actually a solid. The question is, if I've got my big giant plastic jar of sodium hydroxide pellets, how would you prepare 125 milliliters of 6 molar sodium hydroxide? Well, let's just think about this from a, a practical perspective for a second here. You know, how would you physically do this? Well, uh, what do I need here? Well, I need 125 milliliters of water here, approximately. Uh, is that something I can get pretty easily? Yeah, I can get that. Do I have glassware that can measure that? Sure, I got a ton of glassware that can measure something like that. So yeah, that's no problem. All right. Well, what else do I need? Well, I need my sodium hydroxide, and I've got a ton of that. But I need to know how much sodium hydroxide to take out of the bottle to put in my 125 milliliters of water. Okay, so I need a scale. So if I can figure out how much sodium hydroxide is in that 125 milliliters of solution, then I can simply weigh that out, put it in there, stir it up, and I've got my solution. Does that make sense? So, so really what this question is asking is, how many grams of sodium hydroxide are in 125 milliliters of 6 molar sodium hydroxide? Does that make sense? Okay, well, first question we ask ourselves is, what do we know? What do we know about this solution? Well, 
I know I've got 125 milliliters, and I know that it's six molar in concentration, six moles per liter. All right, which one of those pieces of information am I going to start with? You're going to start with 125 milliliters. Remember, when you see a concentration unit, always start with the other piece of information first. You're going to use that concentration unit as a factor. Six molar means what? Six moles per liter. Does it mean moles per milliliter? No. So what do you think I'm going to have to do with that 125 milliliters before I get started? Well, I need to convert that to liters because molarity is moles per liter. So how am I going to do that? Well, here's 125 milliliters. What I'm going to do to get to liters is I'm going to move my decimal back three places to the left here. Okay, or you could do a factor label if you wanted to here, or you know, divide by thousand, whatever you want to do. But move my decimal three places, one, two, three. And so essentially I'm starting with 0.125 liters of solution here. Okay, we're going to draw a time sign. Now we're going to make a factor. So I'm starting with liters. Ultimately, where am I trying to go to? I'm trying to go to grams of sodium hydroxide. All right. Do I know a direct relationship between liters of solution and grams of sodium hydroxide? No, I don't. Okay, do I know a relationship between liters of solution and anything here? Well, I know a relationship between liters of solution and moles of sodium hydroxide. Where do I find that? Well, that's over here in my molarity, right? So I know for every one liter of my solution, there are 6.00 moles of sodium hydroxide, because that's what 6 molar means. All right, so I can make a factor out of that. So I can put one liter over 6 moles of sodium hydroxide, or I could put 6 moles of sodium hydroxide over one liter. Which do you think is probably the way we want to go here? Well, we want to put 6.00 moles of sodium hydroxide over one liter of solution. Why? Well, we want the liters to cancel out. All right. Now, if we just quit right here, if we quit right here and calculate an answer, what would my answer be in? Would be in moles. Is that what I'm looking for? No, I'm looking for grams. I can't can't weigh I can't weigh moles on a scale. I have to have something in grams here that I can use. So what am I going to do? I'm going to draw another factor. So another time sign, another line. So now we ask ourselves, do we know a direct relationship between moles of sodium hydroxide and grams of sodium hydroxide? Well, I can find the molar mass. See, if you can't do molar mass, you're dead in the water on this problem. You know, everything in this chapter kind of builds. You have to be able to do that before you can do the next thing and so on and so forth. So to find the molar mass of sodium hydroxide, I look up the mass of a sodium, about 22.99 roughly, an, an oxygen, which is 16.00, and then a hydrogen, which is about 1.008, uh, which comes out to 40.00. Can you tell I've mixed up sodium hydroxide before? All right, check my math if you just really want to. Okay, so I know that for every one mole of sodium hydroxide, 40.00 grams of sodium hydroxide. That's just the formula mass. What goes on top, what goes on bottom? Well, moles goes on bottom because that's what I want to cancel out here. See, with my moles of sodium hydroxide here. And what am I left with? Grams of sodium hydroxide, which is what I'm looking for. All right, so now we just do the math. So we got 0.125 times 6.00 times 40.00, so three significant figures here, three here, four here, so my answer should have three, so it's 30.0 grams of sodium hydroxide. All right, but that's not the answer. It's an answer, but it's not the answer to the question. The question is, how would you prepare it? So let's finish it out. Well, you're going to go to the scale, you're going to take 30.0 grams of sodium hydroxide, and then you're going to add enough water to make 125 milliliters of solution. Uh, you know, technically you add enough water to get 125 because molarity is moles per liter of solution, not liters of solvent. But it's going to be 125 milliliters anyway, pretty much. So yeah, if you just did 125 milliliters of water, you're not going to really cause any error here. 
the sodium hydroxide is not really going to take up any space there. So you're going to add the 125 milliliters of water to it, stir it up really good. There you go, pour it in a bottle, slap a label on it, it's ready to go for lab. And that's how it works. Well, that's not too bad, is it? You could probably do this. That's the hard one, actually. Well, let's say, uh, you know, I forgot about the Friday lab section. You know, uh, I, need a, I need another 125 milliliters of 6 molar sodium hydroxide. So I send you back into the stock room again, uh, and you look around. And uh, the bottle that we used last time is gone. The solid that we had last time, that's already been used up. So what are you going to do now? Well, let's say you poke around the stock room and you find a bottle marked 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide. Well, I need 6 molar sodium hydroxide. Is there any way that I could make 6 molar sodium hydroxide from 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide? Well, yes. All I have to do is add water. See, I can dilute it down. You know, if I've got 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide, I can make any concentration lower than that just simply by adding water and stirring it up. All right? So, given as much 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide as you need, we'll say it's a big bottle, how would you prepare 125 milliliters of 6 molar sodium hydroxide from that? Well, basically, you've got to take just enough of the 8.5 but not too much because you need to add water to it and get everything to equal 125 milliliters and at the same time equal 6 molar. Well, that sounds like a very complicated problem, but it's actually not. It's actually very simple if you know this handy dandy little equation. And, and this is an equation that, you know, after 30 years in the business here, I mean, I still use this. I use this just constantly. So, yeah, it's really, really handy to know. And it looks like this. C1V1 equals C2V2. Okay, C1 is your initial concentration. V1 is your initial volume. C2 is your final concentration. And V2 is your final volume. The nifty thing about this equation is it works for any concentration unit you want. You can use molarity. You can use molality. You can use percent by mass. Uh, doesn't matter. You can use any volume unit you want. You can use liters and milliliters ounces, handfuls, thimblefuls, it doesn't really matter. What you have to do, however, is you have to be consistent across the equation. If, it, if you're using milliliters on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you have to use milliliters. You can't use gallons over here and ounces over there. But as long as you're consistent across the equation, it works. And it works because it's a proportion. Now, you know, they will make a big deal sometimes in books. They'll say, well, this is molarity and this is liters you know, uh, moles, uh, moles per liter times liters is equal to moles, and moles per liter times liters is equal to moles, and the number of moles of solute here initially is the same as the moles of solute over here at the end, because all you're doing is just adding water. And yeah, that's true, but that's not why it works. The reason it works is because it's a proportion. That's why it works. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to use liters here. You know, you, you could use anything you want here as long as you're consistent. All right, so how would you prepare our 125 milliliters of 6 molar sodium hydroxide from as much 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide as you need? Okay, well, what's the initial concentration of what I've got here? Well, it's 8.5 molar. Okay, how much that do I need to take? Well, I don't know, so we're going to call that V1. Now, that's okay. If you didn't know something, it wouldn't be a problem, would it? Okay. When it's all said and done, what's my final concentration going to be? What's well, going to be 6 molar? All right. What's my final volume going to be? Well, it's going to be 125 milliliters. All right. So I'm using molarity here and I'm using milliliters here. Is that okay? It's okay here because, yes, this is a proportion. All right. But when I saw for V1 over here, what's V1 going to be in? Well, it's going to be in milliliters because this was in milliliters. If I put this in liters, then V1 would be in liters. All right, so now it's just a matter of solving for V1. So we're going to divide both sides by 8.5. So 6 times 125 by 8.5. Oh, three, three, three significant figures here. Answer needs to have three. V1 is equal to 88.2 milliliters. All right, but again, that's not the answer to the question. The question is, how would you prepare it? 
So basically what you're going to do is you're going to take a graduated cylinder. You're going to take 88.2 milliliters of 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide. And then you're going to add enough water. And there's, there's two ways you could do this. One way you could do it is you could take 125 minus 88.2. You could take 36.8 milliliters of water. Add it to my 88.2 milliliters of uh, the 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide, and that should give you very close to 125 milliliters. You know, when you add two solutions together, 50 milliliters of that and 50 milliliters of this, do you always get 100 milliliters? Actually, you don't. Okay, do you get pretty darn close to 100? Yes. Sometimes you get pretty much exactly 100. It's probably not enough to worry about here. So if you did it that way, that's fine. All right. Uh, Probably a better way to do it would get your get yourself like a 250 milliliter graduate cylinder, uh, and we have big we have like you know one liter graduate cylinders back there you know to mix up things, uh, but basically fill up to the 88.2, and then just add water very carefully up to the 125 milliliter line, and stir, and so that's usually the way we would do something like that. The only problem here is if you overshoot it, and you accidentally get 130 in there, what do you have to do? We have to start over because you can't take out water. You can only add water, so you have to kind of be real careful there. But yeah, just take it, take it to the 125 milliliter mark. That's the second way to do it. Stir it up, throw it in a the bottle. There you go, six molar. All right. So those are two different ways to make the same solution: either weighing it and making it from the solid, or you could also uh, dilute a more concentrated solution. Right. Which one of these do you think is the easiest to do? Well, probably the second one. See, because it doesn't really require any complex calculations, and it's just a matter of adding water to a, a solution. Uh, back in the stock room, when you end up with uh, solutions, you'll notice that when, when you go to lab, there's a lot of uh, things that we use a lot of. Uh, you'll see hydrochloric acid. You'll see sulfuric acid. You'll see sodium hydroxide. Um, sodium chloride sometimes, uh, but there are a, a lot of solutions that we just always using for something or another. And the thing is, it's, it's never the same concentration. You know, one week it might be 0.1 molar, the next week it's 2 molar, 6 molar here, 3 molar there, you know, just never the same same uh, concentration. So we've got, stock, uh, we have in the stock room, we have shelves for some of these solutions. You know, do you think it's a very efficient thing to have, um, you know, nine different concentrations of, of hydrochloric acid sitting on the shelf? Well, no. And so what we have is we have something called a stock solution. Uh, a stock solution is a solution that is more concentrated than you will ever need. And what you do is you take your stock solution and you dilute that down to get concentrations of solutions that you need. So now all i got to have is one bottle sitting on the shelf, and then I can make the stuff as I need. Um, now, stock solutions are always more concentrated. It's very difficult to make 6 molar hydrochloric acid from 2 molar sodium, uh, hydrochloric acid. To do that, you got to figure out some way to add more HCl. But if you're going to do that, you might as well just start from scratch, right? So, yeah, stock solutions are always more concentrated than what you need. Um, and so that, that saves us a lot of space, you know, in bottles and costs and things like that. Now, generally, it's things we use a lot of, you know. Um, Vanadium 4 chloride. Do we use vanadium 4 chloride much in lab? No. So, I mean, it would be kind of useless to have a stock solution of vanadium chloride floating around. Uh, we just mix that up when we need it. But HCl, ammonia, uh, sodium hydroxide, you know, things like that that we're constantly using, that's where stock solutions really come in handy. All right. Sometimes you have to use stock solutions. You don't really have a choice. Uh, HCl, hydrochloric acid, HCl is actually a gas. So you can't actually put that on the scale and weigh it. You know, it tends to float off of you. So essentially we buy hydrochloric acid from the chemical company in very concentrated form, and then we just dilute it down as we need. So sometimes that's the only way to go. Where does preparing a solution from a solid come in handy? Well, the, the downside to diluting solutions is if you're making that sodium hydroxide solution, you have to be absolutely positive that that bottle that you're using was 8.5 molar sodium hydroxide. If it wasn't 8.5 molar, then your solution is not going to be exactly 6 molar. 
Now, if you made it yourself and you're absolutely positive, then that's the way to go. Or if you trust your coworkers, then that's probably the way to go. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes you just want to be sure, right? And so if you weigh things out on the scale and make it yourself, then you've got nobody to blame but yourself if it goes wrong. All right? You're not dependent on someone else calculating the concentration of that stock solution correctly. Uh, but it takes more time. So, you know, there, there are situations where we use both. And yeah, it's probably about half and half, I guess, in lab. So, yes, those are two, two skills to know. And like I say, if you know that, that's 80% of the work, really, in lab. So, yeah, you could actually come work for us, I guess. Okay. Well, molarity is the main one. That's the one you're going to see practically all through this course. But is it the only concentration unit that you see out there? Well, no. So let's talk about uh, percent concentration and a couple of units that are kind of derived from that. Uh, percent concentration, there's actually three. There's actually two, and then one is kind of a hybrid of the other two. Uh, there's a percent by mass, which you have run into in the lab at this point. Uh, there's a percent by volume, and then there's a mass volume percent there as well. All right, so with those main three there, let's talk about definitions here. So percent by mass, sometimes you'll see a percent mm, sometimes it's a ww, you know, by weight, but it's the same thing. You take the grams of your solute, what you're interested in, you put that over the grams of the solution, and then you multiply by 100. And that's what you did in lab with your sugar water solution there. Uh, grams of sugar over grams of solution times 100, mass percent. Sometimes when you're dealing with liquids that are mixed up together, it's easier to deal with volume. And so you have a percent by volume. And it is, as you probably would have guessed, it's the milliliters of your solute over the milliliters of solution times 100 to get into a percent. And then sometimes you have this little hybrid of both that they use, and it's the mass volume percent. And again, it's probably, as you would have guessed, it's the grams of solute that you're interested in over the milliliters of solution times 100. All right, so if I had a 5% copper sulfate uh, mass volume percent solution, that means there are 5 grams of copper sulfate for every 100 milliliters of solution. Now, there are a couple of other units here which are actually closely related to your percent by mass. And these are units that are used when you're dealing with extremely tiny, low concentrations. All right, And one of them is called parts per million, and that's PPM, parts per million. All right, parts per million is grams of solute over grams of solution. Notice it's really, really similar percent by mass, but you're going to multiply by 1 times 10 to the 6th. All right, what's 1 times 10 to the 6th in decimal form? Well, that's a million. So there's your, there's your parts per million. All right, so grams of solute over grams of solution times 1 times 10 to the 6th. All right, where do you see something that tiny? Well, uh, water treatment is probably a, a really good place to uh, to use parts per million. You know, what's the water taste like out here? Is it good? What does water taste like anyway? Well, it's actually tasteless. Water doesn't have any taste at all. all right, so what makes different waters from different places taste different amounts? What's the amount of mineral content they have dissolved in there? You know, the water's running through the ground. It's dissolving all sorts of things like salt and calcium and things like that. Uh, and uh, it gets into the water, and that's actually what gives water the taste. So you're not tasting the water, you're tasting what's in the water. Uh, once stayed at a friend's house in uh, Batiste, Oklahoma, which is kind of on the eastern side of Oklahoma, kind of near the Washtal uh, Mountains there, kind of a forested area. A lot of sulfur in the water. So when you turned on the faucet, it smelled like rotten eggs. Uh, that's that sulfur. So, you know, he stayed in a log cabin with a, a wood-fired stove and a big, giant, huge, hairy dog that shed everywhere. So when you woke up in the morning, you had a choice. You could either smell like a, a smoky dog, uh, or you could take a bath and you could smell like a rotten egg. Well, it doesn't taste a, take a whole lot of calcium to make the water taste like it does out here. Mostly out here, it's calcium, probably a little sodium chloride, calcium chloride, um, some carbonate, a lot of carbonate in the water out here, and a little bit of it goes a long way. 
So when you're talking about dissolved solids in waters, the amount is on the parts per million level, but sometimes even a little bit makes a big difference. All right. um, fluoride in water. Uh, back in the uh, 40s and 50s, they found in these mountain towns that uh, you had kids and had the really ugly teeth. All right. But the thing was, they never had any cavities. So they weren't pretty, but they were sturdy. And so what they found is there was some naturally occurring fluoride uh, in the water out there. And what the fluoride will do is it actually incorporates into the enamel on your teeth. And it, it forms a mineral called uh, fluorapatite instead of the regular hydroxyapatite. Uh, and it turns out that the fluorapatite is harder than the hydroxyapatite. So your enamel is harder, which means more resistant to acid attack from the bacteria, which means less cavities. All right, if you get too much of it, it actually stains your teeth kind of gray. But if you don't get too much of it, you don't get the cosmetic issues and you get the protection. So what they started doing is adding fluoride to the water, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, kind of as a public health thing. Uh, because fluoride is usually not in ground in water in most places. It just, just doesn't occur. And so what they do is they add it somewhere on the order of 0.8 to 1 part per million. And that gives you the benefits of the fluoride teeth-wise, but doesn't give you the harmful effects. You know, if, if you get too much fluoride in the water, uh, then, yeah, it, it actually starts incorporating into your bones which you might think, hey, stronger bones. Well, no, it's actually the opposite. It actually makes them weaker, and uh, so therefore more likely to break, you know, and fracture. And, you know, if you've ever known uh, an older person, uh, especially older women, you know, if they fall and they break their hip, um, they usually go down, downhill pretty quick, you know, once that happens. So, you know, I try, I try not to fall if, if I could possibly help it. Um, but that, that just tends to happen to you as you get older because your bones tend to get a little more brittle. Uh, and, um, you know, if they're already, if they're getting even more brittle from the fluoride, that makes it even worse. So, uh, plus the fact it's also poisonous, actually. Uh, if you get up above uh, six or seven, eight parts per million, uh, yeah, it could actually, you know, long-term exposure could kill you. So, yeah, it's, you know, the poison is in the dose. A little bit's good, a lot not so good. So you want to make sure who, who's ever adding the fluoride to the water um, knows what they're doing math-wise. You know, decimals do matter here. Um, Midland water actually is, is, uh, has what fluoride in it already. It's actually naturally occurring. This is, this is actually fairly rare. And uh, your Midland water is somewhere around about 1.4. You know, 1.4 north of town. Uh, out in the Gardendale area, uh, it gets as high as three to four uh, parts per million. I I've heard in Andrews there was a place where it was six. So, yeah, actually north of town it's a little bit higher, and, and it's just naturally occurring from the groundwater. It's one of my little research projects there. So, But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's where you see parts per million used. That's one where, place you could see them used. Sometimes you need a unit even smaller than parts per billion. Uh, than parts per million. So what do I use there? Well, I use something called PPB, or parts per billion. And the way you calculate that is it's the grams of solute over the grams of solution times 1 times 10 to the 9th, which 1 times 10 to the 9th happens to be a billion. So that's why I call it part per billion. All right? And a part per billion is a thousand times smaller than a part per million. There are a thousand parts per billion in one part per million. All right. Where would you use a unit that tiny? Uh, pollution, okay, uh, lead, mercury, or heavy metal toxins. You know, uh, lead and mercury are what we call cumulative toxins. Um, what happens is you ingest them and, and they don't really bother you that much. But here's the thing about lead and mercury. They really love organic compounds. They love them too much. Uh, they will form bonds with organic compounds, and, and they won't let them go. And so, in organic chemistry, there's ways we can use that, but that's not, I guess, the point here. Uh, the point is, when you get that into your system, your body doesn't eliminate it. It keeps it there. Well, a little bit of lead and mercury is not that big a deal. But over a period of time, let's say, for example, you, you live on the Gulf, and uh, there's some mercury being spilled in the water, and uh, the 
the shellfish you're eating it, clams or whatever, mussels, uh, and that concentrates it. Well, you're eating the clams and mussels, so now you're getting a concentrated form in your body, and then you just keep eating them you know, over a period of years. Um, a little bit's not going to hurt you, but the problem is your body doesn't get rid of it. And so you get a little bit more, and you get a little bit more, and you get a little bit more, and now all of a sudden you're up to a level where it actually causes health issues, and it's stuck in your body. And that's what lead and mercury do. Uh, mercury uh, causes uh, central nervous disorders. I uh, had a professor one time, he's the vice president of the college actually, triple major. He was a uh, chemistry, physics, math major. Triple major. And he ended up vice president of the college, taught a philosophy of scientific thought uh, at, uh, at the college I went to. And uh, he told me one time, I said, yeah, he did his graduate work at uh, OU. He said, yeah, they went in and tore out the lab. And uh, back behind the lab benches, tables, they found these little pools of mercury back there. Uh, because what they were doing is they were using, they were making these organometallic compounds to green reagents to make other things. When you get to organic, you'll hear about those. And sometimes the mercury would spill, and they just kind of shove it off behind the table, kind of like students did in our lab, I guess. Just shove it off there behind the table and not worry about it. Well, it fell down the cracks, and it was stuck back there. And so he said, you know, I'm, I'm getting kind of older, and sometimes my hands kind of tremor. And, uh, you know, I wonder if it's old age or if I wonder maybe it was something, you know, having to do with that. Lead, uh, lead causes uh, dis developmental disorders in small children, makes them kind of moody, uh, makes them want to develop a little bit more slower than their peers. Well, you know, I pretty much, you know, described about 40% of the kids out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, they don't have, like, lead poisoning written across their forehead, and that's the problem. You can't tell. Uh, lead you get from uh, the ground in certain places where they have lead mines. Uh, usually when you find silver, you find lead. Um, gasoline used to have tetraethyl lead, which was a gasoline additive. Uh, it was an anti-knock comp compound, made the gasoline burn smoother. Um, and... Uh, it actually kind of, the, the lead actually kind of lubricated the pistons and made the, the pistons actually last longer. So it was a good thing. The problem was uh, this lead was getting spewed out the tailpipe and then settling on the roadside on the soil. And so they took the lead out of gasoline. And so they had, when I was growing up, they had leaded gasoline and unleaded gasoline. And your car either ran on one or the other. Uh, paint used to have lead in it. Uh, it would actually make the paint stick better. Uh, so that's why you always have to repaint constantly now, because they took all the lead out of the paint. Now, if you got an old house and you start scraping off the paint, uh, then you may be exposing yourself to lead, you know, breathing it in if you're talking about very fine, you know, powder stuff, if you're sanding or something like that. Um, they outlawed lead in the paint because what kids would do is they'd sit there and they'd pick at the paint and they'd have these little paint chips and they'd eat them. Uh, because, well, they're kids, I guess. I don't know. They just love to eat paint chips. And so they were being exposed to the lead. But again, of course, you can't get that out of your body. So it built up to the point where it could have been harmful. And so, yeah, they took all the lead out of these things as a, as a health issue. Uh, a little bit doesn't hurt you, but being exposed to that over a long period of time can be an issue. Uh, and so that's why you have things on the parts per billion scale. All right, makes sense. And, you know, I got more stories, but you probably don't want to hear them at this point. So those are the definitions of your concentration units uh, that are related to percent by mass. So you got molarity and you got percent by mass. What is the percent by mass concentration of a solution of HCl made by dissolving 0.056 grams of hydrochloric acid in 150.000 grams of water? And then while we're at it, what is the solution concentration in parts per million? And then what about parts per billion? Okay, well, this is a problem where they're asking you the concentration. All right, so what did we say? If you see problems where they're asking you the concentration, treat it like a plug-in problem. Okay, ask yourself, do I know what the concentration unit means? Write it down, plug in what you need, and then solve for, for the concentration unit. So I know that percent by mass is grams of my solute over grams of my solution times 100. 
So do I know the grams of HCl here? Yeah, that's 0.056. Do I know how much the entire solution weighs? Be careful here. Is it 150? No, it's not 150. 150 is how much the water weighs. What's on the bottom? Grams of solvent or grams of solution? Grams of solution. All right, now, is it going to be pretty darn close to 150? Close enough you could use that and probably not make any mistakes? Yeah, probably in this case. All right, but not always. All right, so remember, it's not grams of solvent. It's how much the whole solution weighs. So how much does my solution weigh? Well, i got 150 grams of water, but I've also got 0.056 grams of HCl. So my solution weighs 150.056 grams. So remember, this is the total weight down here, not just how much water you've got. All right, so multiply by 100 here. That gives you the percent by mass. Two significant figures here, five here, so my answer should have two. So that divided by that times 100. 0.037% by mass, and that is my percent by mass. All right. What if I had asked you, what's the, what is the solution in parts per million? Well, parts per million is the grams of solute, so that's the 0.056 over the grams of my solution, which is 150.056. But here we're going to multiply by a million instead of 100. So I do that, and I get 370 parts per million. Or 370 ppm. All right. What if we wanted to go to parts per billion? Well, 0.056 divided by 150.056 times a billion, 1 times 10 to the 9th, and I get 370,000 parts per billion. All right. Not all concentrations work equally well for describing concentrations of solutions. It depends on how concentrated they are. It's just like if I want to describe how many, uh, how far it is from here to Abilene, miles would be a nice appropriate unit to use. Inches would probably, you could measure it in inches, but it probably would be just too big of a number and too cumbersome to deal with. So yeah, I probably wouldn't express this in parts per billion, but I could. You know, if I'm dealing with uh, the length of a piece of paper, you know, uh, inches might work real well. Um, Miles would probably be a bad unit to use there because I get a really tiny number. So either of these is probably acceptable. This one, you could do it, but it's probably more cumbersome to deal with. But yeah, you could calculate any of these if you know the definitions. Two more, and then we're out of here. All right, so if you can do this one, how many milliliters of, this is C2H5OH, this is uh, ethanol. Where do I find ethanol? Well, ethanol is the active ingredient in alcoholic beverages, okay? It's, it's alcohol. Uh, can you drink all alcohols, by the way? Can you drink methanol, propanol, rubbing alcohol? No. You will go blind and you will die. Do not drink all alcohols. Is, is ethanol poisonous? Yes, it is. If you drink too much ethanol, you will kill yourself. Um, you have to try pretty hard. But, you know, I've known college students that have tried their very best. So, yes, you, you can kill yourself with alcohol. That's my public service announcement. Uh, so, how many milliliters of uh, ethanol here are in 263 milliliters of 40% volume volume? Uh, that's 80 proof, by the way, whiskey. Uh, proof. Uh, when you deal with alcoholic beverages, uh, you end up with this unit called proof. And proof was created by some sort of advertising genius because essentially what it is, is it's the percent alcohol by volume times two. So 100% ethanol is 200 proof. Okay, 50% ethanol is 100 proof. All right, so it makes it sound twice as concentrated, as I guess. Um, whiskey is about 80 proof, or about 40% alcohol. Uh, beer, wine, um, generally 5% by alcohol, not a whole lot of alcohol in beer and wine. Um, your uh, heavier distilled spirits, your whiskeys, uh, things like that, uh, much more alcohol because they distill them at a distillery and they concentrate that alcohol. Um, you know, it's really hard to kill yourself on beer uh, because, you know, you're just drinking mostly water. 
and your body is eliminating it, you know, as you go. Uh, but again, I have seen people try. Uh, Everclear. Everclear is 95% uh, alcohol. Um, so that would be what, 190 proof? Uh, do not mess with Everclear. Um, you can seriously hurt yourself on Everclear. You know, if you take a big giant swig of something like that, you're, you're dumping a ton of alcohol into your body and your liver and uh, kidneys can't keep up with that. And so, yeah, that's, you know, it, you know, if you're over 18 or 21 or whatever the drinking age is, then, you know, you're going to do what you're going to do. You're not going to listen to me. Uh, but I'm just telling you, just be very careful. And I, I, I honestly, I wouldn't mess with it. Uh, it you know, it could be kind of dangerous if you if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, that's where proof actually comes from. It comes from, uh, from that. How do we do the problem here? Uh, well, notice in this case, they give me two pieces of information. I've got 263 milliliters, and I've got 40% by volume alcohol. So which one of these pieces of information am I going to start with? Don't start with the concentration. Start with the other unit first. So 263 milliliters. Okay. So this one we're going to do by factor label. So I've got 263 milliliters. Here, I'm going to write that down. Where am I trying to get to? Well, I've got 263 milliliters of solution. I'm trying to get the milliliters of alcohol. So do I know any kind of relationship between milliliters of solution and milliliters of C2H5OH? Well, I know the solution is 40% by volume. So now I ask myself, what does that mean? Well, 40% by volume means there are what? 40 milliliters of ethanol for every 100 milliliters of solution. That's 40%. So we're going to make that into a factor. So what goes on top, what goes on bottom? Well, my milliliters goes on bottom here of the solution because that's what I want to cancel out here. That leaves me with milliliters of ethanol. So see, notice we use the concentration here as a factor to get what we needed. All right. Notice this is the same thing we did with the molarity. It's still a concentration unit. It's just a different concentration unit. But the, the strategy here is still the same. So 263 times 40.00 divided by 100 for every exactly 100. There are approximately 40.00, four significant figures here, three here. My answer needs to be three, 105 milliliters of C2H5OH. All right. One more. And then we're done with the chapter. How many grams of KNO3 are needed to prepare... 455 milliliters of a 5% mass volume potassium nitrate solution. Okay. Potassium nitrate, by the way, uh, this is what they put in like Sensodyne toothpaste. Um, that's actually what deadens the nerves in your teeth there. You know, uh, it's actually potassium nitrate. So there you go. 5%, uh, that's pretty close to about the concentration there. Um, so how many grams of this would you need? Well, what am I given? Well, I'm given 455 milliliters, and I know the concentration is 5% mass volume. So what am I going to start with? I'm going to start with the milliliters. Never start with your concentration unit. Always start with the other piece of information. So I'm going to write that down, 455 milliliters, make a time sign, make a factor. What does 5% mass volume mean? Well, it means there are 5 grams of my potassium nitrate for every 100 milliliters of solution mass over volume. So what goes on top, what goes on bottom? Well, milliliters on the bottom, because I want to cancel this milliliters here. Grams on the top, 455 times 5.0 divided by 100. Two significant figures here, three here, so my answer needs to have two. And so therefore, 23 grams of potassium nitrate and 455 milliliters of a 5% mass volume potassium nitrate solution. And that's how this works. All right. So, again, if they ask you for the concentration of a solution, treat it like a plug-in problem. Do I know this? Do I know that? Put it in the definition. There you go. If they give you the concentration in something and then ask you for something else, treat it like a factor label problem. Write down the other piece of information first. Use your concentration unit here as a factor to get what you need. And that strategy works for molarity. It works for percent by mass. 
Uh, it works for percent by volume, works for mass volume, parts per million, parts per billion. Doesn't matter. The strategy works. They're just different concentration units. Make sense? All right. That's it. That's the end of chapter three. So uh, you're ready for a test. So first test field are chapters one, two, and three. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll send you out an announcement, and we'll talk more about all that. So uh, next thing you see will be chapter four, and that will be on your second test, which will be over chapters four and five. Um, and uh, I guess we'll start there. So bye for now.